All right, I think that's all. So tonight, this is our final installment on the series that we've been studying on biblical cosmology. Of course, cosmology is the study of the sun, the moon, the stars, the universe. And we have each step along the way looked at what does the Bible say and then what does science and observation say and does it support what the Bible says or what the atheists, the evolutionists say. And of course, in spite of all of what you would, you would think would be true based on what we're told by all the talking heads on television, you would think science was firmly in the camp of the evolutionists and those who believe in the Big Bang cosmology. However, what we have seen over the last seven installments in this study is that in, in fact, when you look at what observation and true science tells us, everything matches up with what the Bible has said all along. And all of the things that science postulates that disagree with the Bible are really not observations and actual scientific laws. They're just theories that have been postulated to prop up the Big Bang Theory uh, of cosmology. Speculating. Speculating. Absolutely. So tonight we enter the final installment, and the title is, Why Would They Lie? And Does It Matter? Because the truth is, as you have seen over the first seven parts of this study, what we have been told since we were old enough to go to preschool all the way up to the present, our entire lives we have been told things that are not true about the sun, the moon, the stars, outer space, and about the earth itself. All of those things uh, patently go against what the Bible says and they go against what true science and our observable uh, senses tell us to be true as well. So tonight we're going to talk about if that's the case, and it is, why would they have lied not only to us and our generation, but why did they begin this lie almost 500 years ago? Because before that, for 5,500 years, all of human history up to that point, everyone believed what you and I have seen from the Bible to be true. Abigail, it's only been within the last 500 years that the lies we've talked about have been put forth by science, by scientists. We, uh, perhaps in, instead of calling it science, what some people call it is scientism. It's a religion, and it's a religion that's based upon a false premise that God does not exist. So... Let's begin our study tonight. We'll try to answer some questions you may have along the way. As we've done each week, we'll hold any questions or comments until the very end, and then you'll have an opportunity to ask questions about anything I might have missed or anything that you have on your mind or heart that I, I haven't covered in these eight weeks. And it'll also be an opportunity if you want to just make your own observations about the study that we've had. So let's look at the unbiblical cosmology of modern science. These are the things that science says that totally contradict the Bible and they contradict what we can see uh, and experience for ourselves. Number one, they say the sun is a star. The Bible in Genesis chapter 1 says something very different than that. Uh, number two, they say stars, which they say the sun is, are huge balls of burning gas. Not only does that contradict Scripture, it contradicts what we can see through a telescope as well. Uh, number three, planets are solid surfaces just like the Earth. Now, the, what they call planets are the ones we refer to, Mercury, Venus, Earth, uh, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and sometimes Pluto, depending on who it is you ask and whether you're talking about the Disney version or the NASA version. Uh, but what we, what we saw from Scripture is that the planets are simply, the word planet literally means wandering stars. They're stars just like all the other stars. They're not uh, something that's terra firma that you could stand on. 
<coughs> there's no Mars that anybody could land on. They're all stars, just like the other stars that are up there, with the exception that they're not staying in position like the other stars do as they go around, revolve around and above the earth every 24 hours. Instead, the planets, these wandering stars, they change their course. And um, we saw some verses last week when we were looking at the study of stars that where God specifically says that those wandering stars have a special judgment prepared for them in the future. I don't know why God would judge some huge ball of burning gas. A ball of burning gas doesn't have anything to deserve judgment that I can think of, but those stars uh, are going to be judged one day in a special way. The ones that wander around and did not stay fixed where God put them and told them to stay. The next one, earth spins on its axis. The Bible says that the earth is still, that it moves not. We saw many scriptures in the Bible that say that. The second, uh, the one after that, earth revolves around the sun. You heard Einstein's own words uh, tell us that either could be true based on the data that we see that either the uh, the earth is not moving and the sun and everything's going around the earth or either the sun is staying still and everything's going around it. Einstein himself said either could be true. We only believe that the earth is going around the sun instead of the opposite because it has to be that way. And yet we know it doesn't have to be that way because the Bible says that the earth moves not. We also saw all of those experiments that were done a hundred years or so ago by the big name scientists who believed in the heliocentric model. And all of their science experiments failed to show any movement of the earth at all. And that's why Einstein, out of nowhere, created his special theory of relativity to, uh, to explain it away but, of course, his special theory of relativity violates numerous known laws of physics. The stars are billions of light years away. The sun is 93 million miles away. The moon is almost half a million miles away. That's what modern cosmology tells us. None of that lines up with what we see in the Bible because the Bible tells us there is a firmament up there. We looked at a number of things that seem to indicate that NASA and those that are the powers that be, maybe only a small handful of them, but they know there's a firmament up there. And the firmament is not just an expanse of space, it's a firmament. There's something firm to it. And it's what the Bible says in the book of Revelation is going to roll up like a scroll. At the second, before the second coming. It's the thing that the Bible says in 2 Peter is going to melt with fervent heat. The elements of the heavens are going to melt with fervent heat. Uh, so the firmament is there. There's nothing past the firmament other than the throne room of God. The shape of the earth is a ball, a globe, a sphere instead of a flat circular plane like the Bible describes it. Outer space is trillions of light years away and infinite in every direction. No, it doesn't go on infinitely. It's enclosed. It's enclosed by the firmament. They, there are millions of planets similar to Earth. No, this is it. This is the only one. God made it this way on purpose. A vacuum exists in space even though light and sound waves travel through space and rocket engines supposedly have thrust against space. We looked at the fact that in no experiment that you can set up in, uh, in a laboratory on earth or up there can you create a situation where there's a, a vacuum right next to a non-vacuum and it stays that way. Because the vacuum always, by nature, sucks away whatever is in the non-vacuum. So there's no way the Earth's atmosphere could be next to a vacuum and not be sucked away into the vacuum of space if there were a such thing. 
not to mention the fact that both sound waves, radio waves, and light waves have to have some medium to travel through, either water or air or something, so they can't travel through a, a true vacuum. Last of all, when all else fails and there's no other way to prop up the sun-worshipping theory of modern science, they call in the high priests of Illuminism to put forth unproven theories which can't be reproduced in any scientific experiment and call them scientific laws such as gravity, relativity, and black matter. Now all of these statements are at odds with the Bible. Every one of those. Why would modern science want us to believe these things? What could be the reasons? Why have they for 500 years push this reality on us that doesn't match up with the Bible and doesn't match up with anything observable for us to see and experience for ourselves. Now, I, I want to stop right here before I go any further and say if, if you've not been here for the whole seven preceding lessons on biblical cosmology and you're sitting there scratching your head saying, okay, is the preacher saying we don't believe these things, that the Bible doesn't say these things? That's what I was taught my whole life. Can I just say, uh, at some point, hopefully we'll get all of these things from the last seven lessons online. You can go back and see them and listen to them yourself. But everything we've talked about is straight out of the Bible. There's nothing we've talked about that hasn't had a foundation in the Bible or I didn't present it. There are lots of things online that you can go look at about cosmology that totally blow holes in all of this, but it's presented by people that don't believe the Bible or don't take the Bible literally. So I have intentionally not brought before you those things. I have presented to you what the Bible says, and it has been the foundation for everything we've talked about. There are some other things that, uh, that I think are important things we all ought to know in life, but they're not in the Bible. And so I don't preach them from the pulpit, and I'm not going to teach on them on a Sunday night. If you ask me over, uh, over lunch or over dinner sometime, supper sometime, I'll be happy to talk with you about the JFK assassination, about 9-11, about a lot of those other things. And I might have some information that you don't know about some of those things I'd love to share with you. But that's not Bible. And I'm not going to use God's time uh, to, to talk about those things. So I've made certain that everything we've talked about is based upon the Bible. Our study has truly been a study of biblical cosmology. But you've seen that even science itself supports the Bible. Reading, writing, and arithmetic. There are two kinds of learning. There's experiential learning and communicated learning. Now you could use other terms. I've chosen these two words because they're, they're easy for folks like me to understand and hopefully you understand them too. The first type of learning I've called experiential is a result of observation through your own five senses. And some examples of experiential learning could be, number one, putting your hand on the hood of the car, which has been sitting in the summer sun, will get you burned. I can learn that for myself by putting my own hand on my own car hood in the middle of summertime and my hand gets burned. I can experience that and learn that all by myself. Second thing, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west is is a visible thing. I can see that, observe that for myself. I don't have to have Brother Mike tell me the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. I can go sit out on the porch in the morning and watch it for myself. And then the third thing uh, you can learn for yourself with your senses is the preacher doesn't sing so well. Uh, you don't need anybody to tell you that. You can experience that all for yourself. But then there's the other kind of learning, and that's communicated learning. That's a result of information you obtain from other sources. And some examples of communicated learning might be the little ditty that we all learned growing up. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. I don't know how many of you learned that when you were learning the date. All right, everybody that's my age or older, I don't know. 
maybe a few younger people too. Uh, number two, we were taught that atoms are made of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Maybe some other things they've discovered along the way since I was in school. I don't know. But I've never seen that. I can only go by what other people have told me. I've never seen an atom uh, through a microscope that was powerful enough. I could see the whirling parts of an atom. And then number three, they say the Loch Ness Monster reportedly lives in Scotland. Much as I'd like to go to Scotland, I've never been to Scotland. And even if I went to Scotland, I probably wouldn't be one of those fortunate enough to see Nessie for myself. So I can only take that at face value based on what others have said. So you're not a rocket scientist. <laughs> we have been repeatedly told for the last 500 years that we must throw away everything that our five senses tell us about the earth and the universe. And that we must instead believe what we're told by the masters of the universe. That is, uh, they're rocket scientists, astrophysicists, mathematicians who deal with calculus and quantum physics and astronauts who have gone where we cannot go or at least supposedly have gone where we cannot go. They want us to ignore all of the experiential knowledge that our senses tell us is true about the world and the universe because after all, we're just backward, superstitious, and ignorant compared to them. Isn't that what they try to make us out to be? Backward, ignorant, and a bunch of superstitious people because we believe the Bible is true and literal. Here's a brief review of just some of the things they want you to ignore. <clears throat> they want you to ignore the fact that there's no sense of motion on the earth. Forget about all their experiments that showed that the earth is not moving. Their experiments, not ours, theirs. By the big names of science. The talking heads of science. Forget about their experiments. Our own senses tell us the earth isn't moving at all. The sun-worshipping priests of modern science claim that we're spinning a thousand miles per hour. That's what they say. The earth is spinning a thousand miles an hour, orbiting the sun at about 66,600 miles per hour, while our entire solar system is hurtling through space at about a half a million miles per hour. Yet there's not the least sense that we're moving. You see the picture of the dog with the fan blowing his hair there. Uh, if we were spinning a thousand miles an hour, whirling around the sun at 66,000 plus miles per hour, wouldn't we feel some sense of motion? You'd at least think so. Remember, they're stuck with that old conundrum of, well, then uh, if we're going to get them to believe that, are we going to tell them that the the atmosphere around the earth is, is stuck to the earth. That's what they tell us. That's why we don't sense any motion because the air around us is stuck to the earth by gravity too. And yet, mysteriously enough, they say, well, there's that thing called the Coriolis effect. The Coriolis effect is the supposed result of the earth spinning upon things which are not directly attached to the earth and it's supposed to account for such things as water going down the drain in opposite directions in the northern and southern hemispheres, supposedly. The movement of the focal pendulum, those pendulums that hang suspended and supposedly move on their own because the earth is supposedly spinning. The reason that snipers have to take into account the earth's spin on long-range kill shots on the battlefield. And according to... Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, the reason that field goals are made or missed in very important football games. I'm only going to show you one video this week in our final segment, and it's only about a minute long, but this is the one I'm going to show you. You'll get a kick out of it if uh, nothing just a, else. Just a quick aside. Um, I, I was channel surfing one day, waiting for a movie to come on at the top of the hour. I had 15 minutes. I hit a football game and they just ended the game at a tie, and they just started overtime. I said, that's about right. Let me just watch this. How bad could it be? After the necessary exchange of possession, it became sudden death overtime. 
And then one of the teams, Cincinnati Bengals, got within 50 yards and they kicked a field goal. And the ball rotated up. It hit the left upright Ooh. of the goal post and went in. And I said, ooh, wait a minute. And I said, which stadium is this? What's the latitude? And I looked at the orientation of the stadium, I did a calculation, and then I tweeted. And I said, <laughs> the, the, the overtime winning field goal by the Cincinnati Bengals was likely aided by a one-third of an inch deflection to the right imparted by Earth's rotation. <laughs> Which People lost the their minds. <laughs> People, oh my, the, the local sports channels. And, and, and so the point is, if, if, if you are going north-south at all uh -huh. in the northern hemisphere, you will deflect to the right, no matter what you're doing. Okay? That's, that's why you have a low-pressure system, and I'm a ball of gas below it. If it's low-pressure there, and I'm air, I'm going to head for the low pressure. That's how this works. It's low pressure. That means it's higher pressure out here. So all the pressure is going to send me in that direction. But I'm crossing lines of latitude. And so Earth's rotation will deflect me to the right. How about, what, how about air that's above it? It says, I see a low pressure system. Let me go to it. So it goes to it, and it deflects to the right. So all this air deflects to the right. But it's still trying to get to the center of the low pressure system. But it can't because it keeps getting deflected. And all this deflection becomes this cyclonic energy that turns into a storm. And that is how you get hurricanes, tornadoes, uh, um, um, what do you call it? Um, cyclones. Cyclone. Okay? Now, first of all, he needs a lesson in uh, basic meteorology. That's not how those things are formed at, at all. Uh, but his point is that the football flying through the air was automatically moved over just a little bit because the earth was spinning enough during the time from the football place kicker's toe kicking the ball till the ball got to the goal post that the earth had spun just about a third of an inch to help it go into instead of bounce out of the field goal post. Now, that's what they call the Coriolis effect, that belief that things flying through the air that are not attached to the earth are affected by the curvature, uh, excuse me, by the rotation of the earth. But really what they're wanting is to have their cake and eat it too because these are the same people that have told us that things such as helicopters that take off and go up into the air um, they're not affected by the rotation of the earth. Otherwise, you could go straight up in a helicopter, hover there for an hour near the air equator, and you would come back down a thousand miles away from where you took off without ever going anywhere, just by hovering in place. So they want to say that some of these things do uh, stay attached with the air, like helicopters, airplanes, but things like footballs, sniper bullets, other things, Artillery. mysteriously, they do not. Uh, they have to be taken into account, uh, the, the curve, uh, the, the uh, rotation of the earth in order for them to get to the right place. In reality, airline pilots don't calculate any of that in. When they take off from a destination and fly to another airport, they don't take into account any of these things. You say, well, preacher, that's because nowadays they have computers on board that do all of that for them, make all the calculations and everything. Before they ever had those things on airplanes, they didn't take any of this into account. They plotted their course from one point, took off at this airport, airport headed in a certain direction, and landed at the airport right on time, and it had nothing to do with the rotation of the earth, and they didn't do anything to calculate in the rotation of the earth. It's all made up. Uh, just a, a quick... So how is it that 
The helicopter can't just hover in place and come back down a thousand miles away, but yet the football uh, is affected by the spinning of the earth. You can't have it both. It's either one or the other, but you can't have it both ways. But that's what Neil deGrasse, uh, deGrasse Tyson and the other talking heads would have us to believe. They also want us to forget that the heavens above us appear to revolve around us with the North Pole or Polaris at the center. And that it's been this way for 6,000 years of human history. Ever since God put Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. That's what it's looked like. Night after night after night. And yet we supposedly have been flying millions of miles a day through space. And yet everything is still in its proper place except for those wandering stars that are going to be judged one day. They also want you to forget that it's pretty obvious to our senses that the sun and the moon seem quite close. Not at all 93 million miles away for the sun or a half a million or so miles away for the moon because we talked last week about the crepuscular rays of the sun. We talked about basic trigonometry and geometry and you can pretty well calculate where the sun is there and knowing the distance on this uh, location here, you can tell that's not 93 million miles away that's the source of that light. It's kind of like in a lot of those NASA photos from the supposed moon landings, you can see the astronaut's shadow on that side of him and then he walks over here and lo and behold, the shadow's on the other side of him because there are different light sources that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the fact that you can tell there's one light source there. It's the sun, and it's not 93 million miles away. We talked about the fact that the Bible clearly says the moon is a light. It's not a reflector. It's a light. And if you shined a light at a ball of anything, the, what you would see is you'd see a bright spot right there in the middle and then it would just kind of get less and less light as you got further away from the center of where that light was hitting. There's no bright spot there. It's not getting darker as you get near the edges of it. That's not a reflector. It's simply a light like the Bible says it. The moon is a light all her own. Preacher, I, I just can't believe that. That's not what I've been told my whole life. That's not what uh, my science teachers told me. <laughs> How am I going to tell other people that? Well, that's another question we'll come to at the end. We're told that uh, we need to forget the fact that stars and planets look like they're just lights up there in the firmament. And um, we're supposed to forget what the Bible says, that the stars are lesser lights. So whatever the sun is, the stars are lesser lights, not the same as the sun or greater than the sun, like we're told to believe. They want us to forget that uh, spinning balls don't hold things in, pull things in, but rather things that are spinning throw things out. And if you take a ball of anything and you spin it, that's what's going to happen. It's going to sling things off, not pull it in towards the center of the ball. But they want you to just act like you don't know that's the truth. They want you to forget that there's no proof that any such thing as gravity exists. You say, preacher, I, I, everything goes, falls down. We talked about that. We talked about the laws of density and mass and why things go down. If they're in a medium, whether it be air or water, if they're less dense for their mass than what it is they're, they're in. But... Yet gravity is supposedly strong enough to hold the oceans to a spinning ball, and yet weak enough that birds can still fly, and insects for that matter as well. They want you to forget that there's no way to reproduce a vacuum next to a non-vacuum. And You see the meme up here. Do you know how the Earth's non-vacuum meets with the vacuum of space? And they're saying, neither do we. They tell you that's the way it is, but they can't reproduce it. They can't explain how or why that is because it violates all the known laws of physics that they say are true. But they would 
want you to just forget that because it doesn't work with their model of things. They want you to forget that the earth appears flat no matter how high you go. It doesn't appear curved unless you look through a fisheye lens that makes things look curved. They want you to forget that the horizon always rises to eye level instead of falling away like a ball. The higher you go, if the earth was a ball, you should have to progressively look down further and further as it drops off underneath you. That's not what the earth does. The higher you go, no matter how high you go, all the pictures that we have, even from their scientists, show that the horizon just, it's always, even with eye level, just like a flat plane would be. They want you to forget the fact that there's zero evidence of curvature. We showed how, based on what they say the dimensions of the globe supposedly are, you can figure out the curvature of the earth at any distance based upon 8 inches per mile squared from, from the source, from where you're standing. And how that after just a, not too many miles, you shouldn't be able to see something. Uh, it should be over the curvature of the earth. Remember, they say that's why you can't see ships after a while because they sail over the curvature of the earth. And yet we saw very clearly how when a ship appears to have sailed over the curvature of the earth, if you pull it back up with binoculars, the whole ship comes back into sight. And then if you watch it through the binoculars till it appears to go over the curvature again, you get a higher power telescope out. It pulls the whole ship back up into sight again. Why? Because it never went over any curvature, it's just the perspective, the law of visual perspective, diminishing perspective. And we looked at some examples of that uh, from our everyday lives. We saw some examples of lighthouses and statues and other things including mountains and city lines that are miles and miles and miles away from where an observer is standing And that if the globe model is true, you should not be able to see those things because they're below the curvature of the earth. They're down here after the earth is curved over. You shouldn't be able to see them anymore. And yet you can just as easily uh, as if you were looking right across the the street at it if you have a high enough powered lens looking through it. If the earth was a globe... You couldn't see those things because they wouldn't be visible. I don't see any way around that. Of course, their explanation for everything they can explain is refraction. Well, the light is just bending the image of that up into the sky, and you're seeing it hovering up in the sky because it's a mirage of sorts. Well, first of all, most of the time, mirages are inverted. They're upside down. Secondly of all, it's kind of miraculous that all of these supposed mirages, they happen all the time, and they always end up looking like they're just sitting right on the horizon. They're not up here. They're just right on the horizon, even when you're looking at them through a lens. So, to me, it seems almost impossible to explain why can you still see all these things if there's supposedly a curve there. And then here's another thing from the Bible that I inserted that we didn't talk about during the earlier part of our study, but I'm inserting it here because in the Bible, in the book of Revelation, the Bible talks about the new city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. John says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And in verse 10, And he carried me away into the Spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, and had a wall great and high and had twelve gates. And the gates... Uh, At the gates, twelve angels, and names were written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Verse 16, And the city lieth four square, that is, it's a square, 
and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are all equal. That's a cube. The length, the breadth, and the height. It's a 3D city. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night, and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. So it's going to sit on the earth when it comes down. The new earth. 12,000 furlongs is approximately 1,381 miles using Roman furlongs. According to the curvature of the earth for a globe, the new Jerusalem will have more than 100 miles of space between the city and the earth it's sitting on, on all sides because a cube does not sit flat on a ball. This would, you can't read all that because it got uh, wiped out, but this would pose quite a problem for people trying to use those gates that are on all the sides of the city of New Jerusalem for people to come in and go out on the new earth when it's created. You see, this first picture shows roughly the size of 1,400 square miles, what it would look like in relation to the size of these United States. It's basically more than half the size of these United States if it sat down flat on America. Over here you see a rendition of what it would look like as a cube sitting right there in that same place. And in the middle you see what it would look like sitting on the globe the size that it is. Uh, a, a globe... Uh, with a square sitting on it right there, um, it doesn't fit flat. If there are gates all the way around this city to go in and come out, it's going to be kind of hard to come in and go out of those gates if it's not sitting flat. You know this from playing with tinker toys and building blocks when you were in preschool. Uh, squares don't sit very well on circles or balls. But you see uh, what that would look like if the new city Jerusalem was coming down to sit on a new earth that was a ball like we've been told it is. And then another reason, another thing they want you to forget is simply that the Bible says that this is the way the earth was created. We've talked a good bit about that. We've seen this image a number of times. This is the ancient Hebrews concept of what the earth and the universe looked like at the time that God created everything. And uh, so they want you to forget that. They want you to discount that because, of course, they don't believe in God or the Bible. That brings us to the end, almost, of our presentation for this final installment. Remember though, with all the things they want you to believe and all the things they want you to not believe and to forget, that all sources of knowledge are not created equal. Things like the age of the earth, the spinning of the earth, the reflection of sunlight on the moon, the revolution of the earth around the sun, and the vastness of infinite outer space beyond Earth's atmosphere. Why, are, why is it that all of these things that we have learned as a result of the communicated learning, things we've been taught since we were children, we have not experienced any of them with our five senses. None of them are observable. They all go against what we can see for ourselves. But who is the source of that knowledge? Who is the source of telling us those things? Is it a reliable source? They're the same source that told us that man came from apes. Do you believe man came from apes? Uh, the preacher doesn't. They're the same people that says that God, don't, God does not exist. Do you believe them about that? I don't believe them about that. They're the same people who tell us that the universe began with a big bang explosion instead of God created it. Do you believe that? I don't believe that. If we don't believe them about these things and they intentionally lied about these things, why do we give them so much credibility on those other things that we can't see for ourselves? Why would we do that? 
Who again are those sources who have told you that everything your senses tell you are untrue? And that you should believe in a spinning ball circling the sun and supported by such unprovable theories as gravity, relativity, and black matter instead of the Bible. Who are they? Well, I'm not talking about your third grade teacher. And I'm not talking about your, even your science teacher at the university. I'm talking about who told them that. Where did their source come from? What was their source of information? Where did it all begin? Who were the men who made up this lie or this web of lies? Well, they fall into several categories. Many of them, as we saw by a few examples, are 33rd degree Masons. We're not going to go back through tonight what Freemasonry teaches, what it believes, but it's contrary to the Bible. Most of the Masons that you and I know that are members of a local lodge, they don't know any of this. They don't know the lies that undergird Freemasonry. But Freemasonry is a religion. If you know a Freemason, they will argue all day long with you that Freemasonry is not a religion. But whether they understand it or not, Freemasonry is a religion. The men who wrote... The books by which they carry on their rites and rituals say it's a religion. It's kind of a shame that they don't know what their own leaders say about their organization. Albert Pike, Manly P. Hall, many of the other renowned writers of Freemasonry say very plainly, Freemasonry is a religion. It just happens to be a religion that doesn't line up with the Bible. But many of those spinning the lie for the last 500 years, one of the things many of them have in common is that they were Freemasons and many of them 33rd degree Freemasons. The mo- most of the Masons you and I know, they're either first degree, second degree, or third degree Masons. Very, very few of the people you and I will ever have an opportunity to meet in person are 33rd degree Masons. And the 33rd degree Masons keep in the dark those who are the lower level initiates. I've done a couple of studies in the past on Freemasonry, its origins and what they believe. At some point I'm probably going to do another and how it compares to the Bible. Um, But uh, we'll just have to leave it where it is for right now. One of the other groups are the alchemists and pseudoscientists. These are the people that supposedly were trying to turn lead into gold, but in reality they were trying to do some other things, and that was their cover so that people would leave them alone to do their worship of the sun, their heliocentrism, and undermining of the Bible along the way. It was all done in the name of science, But it wasn't really science. It was pseudoscience. And then there are the Illuminists, the ones who practice occult rituals, belong to occult organizations, whether it's Freemasonry or any number of uh, uh, several dozen other secret societies. They're part of occultic groups who believe in, well, they're worshiping the sun. That's why they're called Illuminists. But the sun is not really who they're worshiping. They're worshiping the God who is behind the sun or the God who claims to be deified through the sun, and that is Satan himself. Those who are teaching and preaching to our children that man came from apes, that God did not create the universe, that there is no God, and that all of this is in some infinite space and earth is in an insignificant place and you don't matter because earth doesn't matter, it's just an accident. All those trying to get you to believe these things are trying to get you to believe those things and our children to believe those things because they don't believe in God, they don't want you to believe in God, 
And more importantly, they don't want your children to believe in God. And they're okay with you sending your kids to Sunday school on Sunday as long as they get them the other five days of the week. Because for generations now, they've been inculcating this doctrine upon one generation after another, even in Christian homes, Christian families, and even in America. And the other group that's responsible for this are liars. People that just make a habit of lying. And uh, you see the logo for NASA there, but NASA is responsible for numerous lies we've talked about in this very short series. We haven't even scraped the surface of all the lies that we could talk about that we know NASA has lied about. And uh, again, just a drop in the bucket of what we could have talked about. They're all part of Mystery Babylon, the new world religion that really isn't new. It started at the Tower of Babel. It will finish with the Antichrist in the tribulation period. It's where we're heading. It's the reason that all the religions that split off of the Roman Catholic Church, all the Protestant denominations, they're all coming back to Mother Rome now, except for Bible-believing churches. And all those different religions that are not associated with Roman Catholicism, Hinduism, Buddhism, all the other major world religions, they're all finding common denominators where they can work together, believe in something together. At the root of every single one of those religions that seem so different from each other are the same basic beliefs. And they all came from the Tower of Babel and the religion that came from ancient Babylon. We were all told the same big lie. And I guess one thing I want to say as we finish this study is, you say, preacher, I just really feel bad because I didn't know any of this before. And I, I've read my Bible my whole life, but I've, I've never seen any of this before or I've never thought about it this way before. And, and to be honest with you, I, there were some things in the Bible that didn't make sense to me, but I just figured... You know, the scientists know better than I do, and I don't understand how it can fit with what the Bible says, but I guess we just have to accept what they say is true. If that's you, don't feel bad, because you're just like every other one of us sitting here this evening. And I would strongly suspect that other than my son back there and maybe one or two other people, there probably isn't anyone in here tonight that knew the things we've talked about the last eight weeks before we talked about them the last eight weeks. And there's a reason that the preacher started over here and we worked our way week by week building upon Scripture each time until we got to where we are at this point. Each part of Scripture, a building block, because quite honestly, if I had thrown everything at you that you saw in the 5th, 6th, and 7th week on the first week, you'd have left with a headache, you would have left scratching your head, and you might not would have come back the second week. But when you see what Scripture says and how everything observable matches up with what the Bible says... It's kind of hard to deny it at that point. And if you're someone who says you believe the Bible, you're left with having to decide what you're going to do with it. Now, as your preacher, I'm not going to tell you you have to believe what the preacher believes. I believe with all my heart everything I've presented to you for these eight weeks. I have no doubts, no questions at all. In fact, this is the same place I've been in my position for three years now. But you didn't know that. I've got up and preached. I've got up and taught Bible studies for the last three years. And with the exception of a couple of people here, nobody knew that the preacher, this is what the preacher already knew and believed. You didn't know that. It didn't stop me from doing the things as a pastor I needed to do to minister to you and to other people.
But you've seen these things for yourself now. Just like at some point I saw them for myself. You have to make the decision what you're going to do with it. I'll be honest with you, after seeing the things I've seen that I've presented to you and a whole lot more I haven't had time to present to you, there's no way I would ever want to go back to not knowing what I know now and what I've presented to you. And even if the rest of the world that's running up and down the road all around us doesn't believe it, doesn't see it, doesn't want to know it, doesn't want to even talk about it, it has profoundly affected my relationship with God in ways that I can't even describe. The fact that everything that we've been told about the universe, it's not infinite going on in every direction. We're not just a little speck somewhere that doesn't matter somewhere that... No. We are the center of God's creation. And everything else revolves around this earth. And we are the center of God's attention on earth. We are significant. And it's all a lot local, a lot closer. And even the firmament above the earth that's described in Genesis 1 is real. And that means the throne room of God on the other side of the terrible crystal that Ezekiel saw from below and John saw from above. It's real too. And it's not that far away. And our God has a personal watch on everything going on on this earth. And He is coming back. And I suspect he could be coming back real soon. He's a personal God. And my study of biblical cosmology for me has made him more personal than he's ever been before in my life. Don't feel bad if you've been presented with things you never knew before, never believed before. Don't feel bad if it has challenged you to question everything you've been taught since preschool. Because everybody here has now been through the same thing. But we've all been presented with the same information. It's up to you what you'll do with it. By the way, I say don't feel too bad about it because we've been presented with it in the classroom since we were old enough to go to school. We've been presented with it every time we turned on the TV or watched a Hollywood movie. We've been presented with it even when they weren't talking about it. We've been presented with their cosmology. It's kind of hard to undo. 10 years, 18 years, 20 years, 50 years, 70 years worth of propaganda. But that's what we've all been bombarded with daily. Don't feel bad that you believe what you've believed up to this point. That's what you've been... Spoon-fed every day of your life, as have all of us. By the way, that center one was taken from Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer or uh, Santa Claus is Coming to Town, and it's in everything. They have been presenting us these things at the earliest of age all the way to adulthood. The biblical model of the universe... What if every one of these seemingly unexplainable things in the Bible immediately made sense if you changed just one thing that you've believed your entire life? Something that you have believed just because you were told it was true, even though it didn't line up with the Bible. Look at these things in the Bible that are easily explained if you just accept the biblical model of cosmology. The sun stood still. The Bible says that. Nebuchadnezzar's dream vision of the tree where you could see to the ends of the earth. The sundial moving backwards with Hezekiah. Jesus being taken up onto a mountain high enough to see all the kingdoms of the earth. It only fits on one cosmology and it's not the one we've been taught in school. What about Ezekiel's vision of the terrible crystal up above? What about the heavens rolling up like a scroll and then melting? What about all the stars falling to the earth during the tribulation? 
Again, if stars are what we've been told by science they are, the earth's in trouble. And what about what the Bible says, that every eye shall see Him at the same moment when He returns at the second coming. All of those things that seem really impossible if you believe what we've been taught about the earth and the sun, the moon, and the stars. But if you just believe in the biblical model, the way that the Bible presents it, they all make sense. All the questions go away, it all makes sense. If you just changed what you believed about one thing. So why then have they been lying to us? Now I'm going to tell you this is, this is the preacher's best idea, my best answer for you. I think the Bible is clear there's a coming deception. Satan clearly is trying to deceive mankind and when the Antichrist is brought onto the scene, he's going to deceive mankind. The Bible says the great deception that's brought upon lost mankind is going to be brought upon lost mankind by God when that happens. God is going to cause lost mankind to believe a lie. You go back and read it for yourself in 1 and 2 Thessalonians. I believe there's a coming deception. And everything they've been trying to get you to believe about the sun, the moon, the stars, the earth, outer space for 500 years has all been to set the stage for visitors showing up. They're going to call them aliens. Folks, they're not aliens. There's nowhere out there for aliens to live. They're fallen angels. They're demons. They're devils. But they're going to show up. They're going to prepare the way for us to receive the Antichrist and worship the dragon, Satan himself. I was talking to Uncle Milton before we started tonight. Uh, Even Congress now has asked the military, the different branches, that by June or July of this year... They want all the evidence that has been kept, compiled by the different branches of the military for the last 60 years concerning UFOs and possible alien encounters to be presented to Congress by the middle of the summer. Now, I'm I'm not a prognosticator. I'm not predicting anything. But I'll just say what my gut instinct is and my best bet is. My best bet is, whether it's this summer or sometime in the not-too-distant future, we are going to be told there are other beings out there and they're visiting earth. And it's all to set the stage for getting mankind to believe that aliens are coming or aliens are invading or aliens are attacking or something. Folks, I just want you to know there's no outer space. There's no planet out there where other beings are living on. These are demons. They're devils. They're fallen angels. And so when you hear those things in the news, you automatically shoot up your antennas, your spiritual antennas, and you know and understand that that doesn't fit with the (coughs) biblical model of cosmology but it does fit with Satan's plan to deceive mankind. There's a reason for 500 years they've been setting the stage for all this. By the way, Hollywood loves to talk about aliens. Hollywood is the number one tool to brainwash people and get people falling falling in line with what Satan wants us to believe leading up to the, the Antichrist and the one world government and the one world religion. This is just one way Hollywood is preparing the stage. But Hollywood has been preparing us to believe in aliens and aliens coming here for more than 50 years. It goes all the way back to the War of the Worlds. And uh, here are some other aliens that are alien stories that are all well known and popular in pop culture that you're familiar with. But you are constantly being bombarded with the belief in aliens and that they are, have, or will be coming here at some point. So why would Satan lie about something as blah, boring, dull as cosmology, science? 
Why would Satan lie about something like that? It seems like a dull, dry college science class. Well, here are some of the reasons. Number one, it undermines the authority of Scripture. That's the same thing Satan did with Adam and Eve in the garden. Got them to question the Word of God. And it's the same thing he's trying to do today to get people to question this book. Number two, it replaces the relevance of the church with science. Where do you go to get your truth about what the the sun, the moon, the stars, and the earth are and how they all work together? Most people aren't getting it from their preacher. They're going to the science class, their college professor, and whatever they believe about the sun, the moon, and the stars, they believe it because science said it, not because it's what they learned in Sunday school or from the preacher. Number three, it destroys our position of value at the center of God's creation. If earth is just one insignificant speck over here in the solar system of an insignificant part of the universe, we're just insignificant. We're just accidents. We have no real value. But folks, that's not it. You are at the center of God's attention. And He cares about you personally. They don't want you to believe that. It creates the possibility of an otherworldly threat to unify mankind. There was a study done by the federal government almost 50 years ago. And they listed the top four or five things that could most easily unite all of mankind together. One of the things they came up with on that list was a supposed alien invasion from another world. The Antichrist is going to try to unite all of mankind under one government, one religion. He's not going to be totally successful, but that's his effort. What better way to unite everybody than to to think we better all band together because there's a threat from somewhere else coming. We better all work together. Somehow our differences aren't as big if we're fighting against something from another planet. Next one, it will offer a plausible explanation after the rapture. Have you ever thought about that? How is, how is the Antichrist going to explain where all the Christians went when the rapture takes place? How is he going to explain that? A bunch of people vanishing. Well, maybe it has to do with aliens from outer space. <laughs> It will encourage lost mankind to worship the host of heaven. I'm telling you, at whatever point alien visitors arrive or we make contact with them, the people are going to start worshiping them. You say, preacher, that's just kind of far-fetched, people worshiping aliens or whatever. Folks, the Bible in the Old Testament over and over talks about the ancient peoples around Israel and even some of the Israelites worshiping the host of heaven. Who's the host of heaven? Angels. But the term host of heaven is used synonymously in the Bible for angels and for the stars too. Why is it that all the Greek gods and goddesses, the Roman gods and goddesses, the Babylonian gods and goddesses, the Egyptian gods and goddesses, the Indian gods and goddesses, all are based on the names of those wandering stars that we call planets. Think of the names of them. Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto are all the names of gods from ancient mythology. And they all portray Nimrod, Semiramis, and their child Tammuz from Mystery Babylon, the religion of the Tower of Babel. Folks, there's a reason for all of that. Last of all, it provides an excuse not to be accountable to a holy creator. Folks, if you don't want anybody telling you what to do, you've somehow got to get rid of God. And that's what they've tried to do is get rid of God. Nietzsche said in the early 20th century that God is dead. You and I know God is not dead. Nietzsche is dead, but God's not dead. And that's their goal, though, is to put away the concept of God as you and I think of God from this book. 
because they don't want anybody telling them what they can and can't do. They don't want to be accountable to a holy God. Last of all, why does it matter? When most people are confronted with the facts of biblical cosmology, their initial unbelieving question is, why would they lie to us about the shape of the earth and whether it moves or not? Then when they finally give up trying to defend that idea of a spinning, orbiting earth in an infinite expanse of outer space with millions of earths out there because none of the, none of the evidence supports any of that, they change their argument to the question, then why does it even matter? Why even talk about this? If you present to someone all the things, all the evidence that you and I have looked at the last seven weeks up to tonight, they might come to the point of saying, okay, I can't really explain any of this, but, but even if it's so, why does it even matter? Why should I get out of my comfort zone and, and maybe agree with you when everybody else doesn't agree with it, why don't I just leave it alone? Why does it even matter what I believe about this? Well, here are a few good reasons. First of all, it matters because of the realization that you've been lied to about the most basic things on earth. If you've been lied to about this, then about what else have you been lied to? And it explains a lot of other things spiritually, economically, politically, and more. What you believe about the nature of the earth and the universe shapes your view of creation, God, man, the future, and yourself. It does matter. And if you're here tonight and you say, Preacher, I think you do a great job teaching the Bible. I think you do a great job preaching on Sunday morning. But this is something that I... It just goes against everything I've been taught. I'm not even willing to consider it All I can say is this. My job as the preacher is to present the truth from the Word of God. You've gotten the Word of God presented every night that we've been here. What you do with it is up to you. You can take it and just put it over there and walk away from it. But how you could do that and be honest with yourself or with God, I'm not quite sure. Nevertheless, I'll say before I finish, that whether you agree with the things you've seen and heard presented for the last eight weeks or not is not going to stop the preacher from loving you, caring about you, pastoring you, and trying to teach you the other things in the Bible either. You didn't know I believed any of this for the last three years. It's not going to stop me from ministering to you after this. But my belief is that if you just accept this book for what it says, even if the people out there you talk to aren't willing to believe it. It will change your Christian life and your personal relationship with Him. Now at this point, I'm going to open it up for questions and comments. I've already had one question, actually two questions, so I'm going to try to answer those and then I'll take other questions. The first questions I had asked to me is, um, what do I do with this? How do I try to talk to other people about this? Because I think... From what I've heard over the last eight weeks, there are some folks that are here, have been here for the study. You're excited about the things you've seen and heard because, quite frankly, you've never been presented with it before. And up until about three or four years ago, I'd never been presented with it before. And I know how excited I was when the scales came off my eyes and I started seeing it for myself. You want to tell somebody else. So here's my best suggestion to you. You saw how I started and progressively got you to the place we are tonight. I'm your pastor. For most of you, I hope all of you, you trust me anyway. You allowed me to show you these things from the Word of God to get you to the point where we finished up. But if I had just, as I said, started with those things back over here on day one, you wouldn't have listened even to the preacher. So if you're going to share these things you've learned with others that probably have no clue because they've been taught the same things you and I were taught our whole lives, don't start over here. Start over there. And somebody uh, in our congregation uh, said it, I think, the way I would say it best. 
maybe a good way to start is just asking them a couple of questions to get their minds thinking a little bit. Get them thinking about some of the inconsistencies in the things we've seen over the last eight weeks. Get them asking their self, themselves questions about the official version of cosmology. And then as they begin to open up and you see that if you see that they're actually giving it consideration, then ask them some more questions. Lead them with, their, with your questions. Sometimes the young people get upset with me because they'll ask me a Bible question and instead of giving them the answer, I start asking them questions because I, I want them to figure it out for themselves. You and I can do that the same way. It's just the way lawyers are taught in law school. It's called the Socratic method. I would strongly uh, suggest that one of the things that uh, might give you an indication whether somebody even has an open mind about questioning the official version of things in this subject matter would be to ask them questions about some other things that you know we've been lied to about. If they're open to believing that the government or NASA has lied to us about other things, they might be open to you suggesting that maybe we've been lied to about this. That might be the Apollo landings. It might be 9-11. It might be a number of things that you know we've been lied to about. And if they're open to believing that we've been lied to about those things, they might be open to believing we've been lied to about some other things, including this. The second question I got asked before tonight was, um, do I think everybody at NASA knows all this? How could they possibly keep this a secret if they know this is true already and they're trying to keep it hidden? I don't think the vast majority of people at NASA know any of this. I think there's a small little handful of people that know this, and they're keeping it to themselves. There aren't, in, in the last 50 to 60 years, of all the countries on the earth, there are only maybe a couple hundred quote-unquote astronauts. Then there are those who run the space agencies of the major countries. There, there's only a handful of people that could possibly know the truth about what you and I have talked about. It's not a bunch of people. And by the way, the majority of those people that are holding on to the lies and putting out the lies, most of them are members of secret societies. And as I heard another preacher say one time, people that are members of secret societies are real good at one thing. You know what it is? Lying. Keeping secrets. Yeah, lying, but keeping secrets about the lies. That's why it's a secret society. So I submit to you, there are not a lot of people that know the truth. That's why NASA is very compartmentalized. Everybody only knows what they're looking at. That's all they see. That's all they're responsible for. They don't know anything else. I personally know some people that have worked for NASA and or NASA related companies over the years. They didn't have a clue about what anybody else was working on except what they were working on. So, I've answered two questions. Anybody else have any questions before I take comments and observations? Any other questions? I don't see any hands. I've answered all your questions in eight weeks. All right, I, I'm always available afterwards. You did a good job. Uh, thank you, Brother John. <laughs> Either that or I created more questions than they... No, I think he did a good job. All right, so now I'll open it up the last few minutes to comments or observations.